go into our next study, uh, our next chapter, Exodus chapter 19. Um, we're going to see some things today that um, are very, uh, 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 I would say, uh, uh, shadowing of the nature and the connection of Jesus Christ uh, to his relationship with the Father. We never forget that uh, God is one God. However, in Scripture, his ability to have personalities that are distinct, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is never lost on us. Uh, we're always aware of that. Um, and then from time to time, we see things that point to that relationship that is important to keep in mind. Uh, and so when we, we see it sometimes talked about directly in New Testament scripture, and then sometimes we see it pointed as an illusion or an allegory or a type or a shadow in the Old Testament. And we'll see some of that today, all right? And we'll point that out uh, as we go forward. But let's go ahead right now and get our reading in um, Exodus chapter 19. Let's take a listen. Chapter 19. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, and they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God. The Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, that there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voices of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. They stood at the nether part of the mount. And outside I was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down. Thou shalt come up thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. 
So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. All right. There we go. Now, this is, as you can uh, see, the beginnings of what we're going to see as the Mount Sinai experience. Quite a few things are going to happen here, and this is a very uh, interesting and, and usually very popular portion of Scripture where we're going to uh, see the children of Israel get many, many instructions. Uh, one of which is very popular. We're all familiar with the Ten Commandments. That's going to happen uh, in this uh, scenario as well. Um, we're also going to uh, see here that there are going to be things that we will see uh, that will be acts of the people to do, which they will be willing to do, but we know they're not going to do it. Uh, it's not going to be something that they're going to do continuously. They're going to have some zeal, but they're not going to have the power to be able to do it. And we're going to speak to that. That's important to recognize uh, because it means something. Uh, it's not that God's telling them to do something and he's like, oh, I'm telling you to do this because <laughs> I know you're not going to uh, make it anyway. And it also speaks to that whole concept of even when the he, God put Adam and Eve into, into the garden. Uh, once again, God was not shocked, surprised, or, or caught off guard because of what happened. This is all part of what God is doing. Remember, Jesus said, and this is important to keep in mind, to the Father, he said, give to me the body that you have prepared for me before the foundations of the world. So that means before the, the earth was even created, before Adam and Eve was even there, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit already had in plan to redeem man. Because Jesus was going to come down. So uh, the whole process of all of this happening is not a shock. We are not in some kind of broken plan. This isn't plan B, C, or D. This is God's will happening. And uh, it's important to keep that in mind. So, when we see these things that, that God's going to ask of the children of Israel, and we know that God's going to ask them to do certain things, and some of the things they're going to be able to do for a little bit of time, some of the things they're not going to be able to do at all, keeping in mind it's not a shock to God. Well, then why is God saying it to them? Well, because it has additional meaning, and it has an ultimate purpose. And it's all truly not to be fulfilled with just this nation, although they will fulfill some of it. But it will all be fulfilled through Jesus. And that's the beauty. So if you plug Jesus into these and say, well, he asked Israel to do that, but did Jesus do it? He's going to ask Israel to uh, accomplish something. Did Jesus accomplish that? And what you will see is the mirroring and the sharing of this information and what we get though they don't recognize it then is a description of the the uh, uh, the mannerism and the actions and the deeds of the Messiah it's written here if you s decide to see it and to look for it you will see uh, a description of Jesus here so let's start and look at that very first verse I mean uh, and, and, and chapter 19 and I'm going to go ahead and mute uh, everyone uh, as usual, just so that, because we get feedback from time to time. This way your uh, audio will be clear. But if you do have something to say, unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. And I certainly want to hear from you. All right. So let me just mute everybody real quick. All right. So when we look at uh, this first verse in uh, Exodus chapter 19, it says, now on the third month, uh, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came uh, uh, they into the wilderness of Sinai. All right. A couple of things to point out here. Um, we already saw them going through various other territories. Remember, they got to one land and it was bitter water had to make it sweet. They got to another land, the land of sin, and they uh, uh, didn't have any water, and God said, I'm going to give you uh, manna, and he also went into another land, and they gave them, God gave them water out of a rock. 
Well, now they're traveling. They've been traveling for how long? Three months. And I'm just going to say that is this is a coincidence that it's the third month? Well, we're going to see three again. Uh, there's something about it. But once again, if you shadow that, does that have anything to do with Jesus? Well, of course. We recognize that Jesus, what? He was, uh, when he died, he, he rose on the what? On the third day. So when we see this, we can once again see that in many ways, subtle and sometimes direct, and this is one that is subtle, it just points to, okay, in my third month, that's when things start to happen. Well, in that third day. So that's something about that three that we're going to see a consistency with. Not just here. We're going to see that throughout the Bible. We saw it already in Genesis and what we've already read in Exodus. Yes, uh, hey, well, you want to say something? Let me unmute you. Number three, isn't that what he deals in threes? Yes, exactly. That's God's number. Yep. Uh, thank yeah. All right. Thank you. Definitely. All right. So, uh, and we're going to see that continuously here. All right. But let's keep reading. All right. And so, um, oh, actually, before I say that, let me uh, also say that uh, on that third month from them coming out of Egypt, they're now at Sinai. So they have gone from Egypt where the uh, worship of false gods was prevalent and now they're coming to Sinai where they're going to get instructions and, uh, and, and introduced to the true God. So it took them three months to go from a land of false gods to a place where God says, I'm going to anchor you here for a period of time and I'm going to show you myself. Now, in showing you myself, that don't mean that you're going to be comfortable. <laughs> and that's something we have to get used to. It's something about that this flesh is not altogether comfortable when God starts doing things. When he starts working out things, the flesh generally gets uncomfortable. Why? Because the flesh is a opposite nature. God is pure holiness. Our flesh is sinful. So discomfort enters into the picture. We're going to see that some more. Let's take a look. So, all right. And he comes to uh, out of Egypt the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. All right. Now, once again, look at the description. It's called the what? The wilderness. All right. Um, this isn't the land of milk and honey. That's where God said he's going to take them. I'm going to take you to a land of milk and honey. But on the way there, you have to go through the wilderness. Now, the wilderness, you're going to get some instructions. And it's in the wilderness that I will truly show you myself. See, God doesn't show you truly who he is. He doesn't open up and give all the personality of who he is and the relationship that he's trying to build. He doesn't give that to you uh, in the land of milk and honey. When you get to the land of milk and honey, Excuse me. You already know God because God has already shown you himself through the wilderness. All right. And so that's an important part of the experience. We don't like the wilderness. I don't like the wilderness. I don't like being there. All right. It's not enjoyable because it's difficult for the flesh. However, it's necessary. You know, when you were, you know, when you're raising your kids and, and they don't want to eat no vegetables, they don't want no Brussels sprouts, they don't want no broccoli, they don't want none of that stuff. And you're trying to get them to eat it because you know it's, it's necessary. No matter how nasty it may taste to them when they were young. Of course, when you get older, you recognize, number one, it's good for you. And I found, a, I've kind of acquired a wonderful taste for that. Very similar to the things of the Lord. And, and, and if we can acquire the taste that the wilderness experience is not the worst it is part of where God shows you your spiritual nutrients, your spiritual vitamins. That's where you get your infusion of strength. Growth uh, but, hmm? The growth process. The growth process, as Penny is saying. Yes. And that happens oftentimes in the wilderness. Okay? So we, all, we, we, we have to try to keep that. We're going to talk more about that. But let's keep going. Verse 2. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai. Okay? So, first it was called, Sinai was called a what? A wilderness. Now Sinai is called what? A desert. So that means 
it, it's a wilderness meaning it don't have any structure, nothing there, nothing, you know, any, anything you need, you got to build it. And then desert meaning you don't have a whole lot to build with. So you're in a place where you don't have, you know, significant structures and resources, but then you also don't have the stuff to even hold you. Desert, you need what? You need water. You need plants and different things, and so you don't have it there. So it's a wilderness desert. That's where Sinai is. But that's where God's going to do his greatest introduction. His greatest, let me show you myself, is going to happen yes. in the wilderness and in the desert. Because he's all we need. Because that's it. Because God is all we need. So he brings you to a place where there's nothing. Can you just need me? Mm. And I can just go back to what I always say. Mm. That's what makes David so wonderful. And David says, Lord, I just want to be in your presence. Oh, that I might know you. Not that I might be wealthy or rich or wonderful. I just want to know you. Amen. And so when we can get grasp that mm. about our personal desires and our, our wantings and our hungers and thirsts, I hunger for God. I thirst for God. I want to know God. When that is... Uh, primary in our work and thinking and deeds it's going to be amazing how the joy and the satisfaction and how this world can't break you and put you down. We can begin to be in joy and sing in prison like Paul did. Yes. Like Peter did. Mm -hmm. Alright? But it takes you've got to experience the wilderness desert Sinai mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get there. All right, and that's what God's trying to do. All right, so it says, uh, and had pitched in the wilderness. All right, so now they pitch meaning they're going to be there for a while. <laughs> Once again, when you enter into a period in your life where you're in that wilderness desert, you're looking to get out. No, God says pitch here. You're going to stay here for a while. Well, that ain't fun either. But well, wait a minute. What are you going to need? Well, we don't have water, we don't have food, we don't have shelter, we don't have... Wait a minute. The Lord is my shepherd. I what? Shall not want. Who said that? David, the man after God's own heart. David recognized that when I don't have anything, when I'm walking... See, we're talking about the wilderness desert, but David said, when I'm walking through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. For what? God is with me. All right. So, once again, it's that mindset. Now, are we perfect? Are we never going to holler and scream when we get scared by wilderness and desert experiences? Well, yes, you probably will from time to time. But when you finish hollering and screaming, can you grasp yourself, gird yourself together, you know, get, get your mind kind of focused and say, wait a minute, okay, let me lean on God again. And that's just the, the, the grasping of your mind. So you bring all those thoughts into subjection to start thinking about, wait a minute, I need to be thinking properly here. I'm reacting to the physical, fleshly pain, but I need to start thinking spiritual. What is God really trying to say? What is God really trying to do? Let me focus and try to pull something out of this other than my own personal discomfort, dislike, and don't want to be here. All right, because this world teaches us that we want to have everything wonderful. You know, we want to have. Uh, uh, Burger King wants you to have it your way. We want to have Miller time, and we, we just want to have all this wonderful relaxation and chilling and just uh, 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 glorious, you know, uh, uh, experiences. But God says, I need you to get to know me, and He generally introduces Himself in wilderness, desert experiences. All right, I think I've said that enough. Let's move along. All right, and it says uh, in verse 3 And Moses went up. Unto God. Now, all right. Another factor to, I, I guess I got to go back to the wilderness desert again. Another factor to this, the wilderness and the desert, and then in order to have that relationship or that communication with God, you also got to climb a what? A mountain. So, <laughs> I mean, come on now. So I got to have the wilderness, I got to have the desert, and I got to climb the rough mountain too? To get to God. Yes. What God is trying to do? He is trying to crucify and remove the flesh. That's why you see Moses, he's going to do this. And you saw Jesus. They do 40-day fasts. Elijah does it as well. And that 40-day fast is to 
allow the flesh to experience all the pain that it can experience to the flesh can no longer just cry out and the spirit is now the only voice you hear well that's part of what we should try to do on a more regular is remove ourselves from always catering to the flesh let the flesh cry and ignore it sometimes and then try to focus more on the spirit We'll be surprised how that might transform some of your, your feelings. and Because a lot of times, if your feelings and your emotions are connected, hardwired, mainly to the flesh, then when the flesh is feeling some way, you're feeling that way. Your emotions are that way. But if you can get the feelings and the emotions connected to the spirit, then when the spirit is feeling good about God, is feeling good about the things of God, then your emotions and your, and your, and your feelings will start to feel the things that your spirit is feeling, not the discomfort that your flesh is feeling. So we got to move the soul to be more connected to the spirit. Oftentimes our soul is more connected to the flesh. And that's why we feel all of our little discomforts and depressions and sorrows and all that kind of stuff. All right, so Moses went up. He's climbing up the mountain unto God. Uh, and the Lord called him uh, out of the mountain and uh, saying, uh, Thus thou shalt say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. So he uses both names here. Remember, Jacob had, had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. So he's going to talk to Jacob, the nation of Jacob. That's that nation that, that has uh, that Jacob kind of uh, mentality. Remember, Jacob was the trickster. That's what the word Jacob means. And then Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which is governed by God. So he, he it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that when God says the description of this nation that is the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he uses both names that are reflective of Jacob, meaning, yes, you will still be kind of trying to do all things to fix your own problem, which is what, what Jacob tried to do himself. And you will also learn to be governed by God, which is with the new name that God gave to Jacob, which was Israel. So God already is letting us know, just by the description that he gives here, sometimes this nation is going to act like Jacob, sometimes they're going to be uh, Israel. So sometimes they're going to be governed by themselves, and sometimes they're going to be governed by me. All right, so they're going to be what? Wishy-washy. And you can see that just in the description here. Um, and you, sit, you look at that and you can point that out. So he calls them both. He calls the house of, of Jacob uh, and the children of Israel. All right? And I can spend a lot of time on that. You know, one being the house, the other one being the children. There's a lot I can say on that. But we'll get to talk about that some more as we go forward. But look at verse 4. Ye have seen uh, what I... Uh, did unto the Egyptians so he's saying you have seen this you are a witness what are we to be we are to be the, the, the a, a individual that can witness the goodness of God and we witness it to the point that where we also make our own monuments our own mindsets our own altars to the things that God has done in our life in the past and that witness of what God's done for you that you can remember because you've seen it with your own being can be your source of strength and encouragement when you're going through your new stuff. You can remind yourself of that. So the fact that you have seen this, you can go back and look. You saw what I did to the Egyptians, to the uh, Egyptians, and how uh, I bear you on eagles' wings. So what he's saying here that eagles' wings points to the what? The spirit of God. All right. Uh, I, I I brought you through through my strength. The Spirit of God, that's how I got you out of the bondage of sin and moved you into uh, the, this relationship now to where you are experiencing me in Sinai, in the desert, the wilderness, by the mountain. All right, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, critical point, if you will obey my voice. And you can almost underline that because this is a promise. God says, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine. Now, 
I might not get I might not finish this chapter here today because I do want to spend some time on this. This is important to keep in mind. First of all, he says, uh, if you and, and, and you can underline if if you if ye will obey my voice. It's an if. It's a condition. That means that you you may do it or you may not. Now, when we go and we remember the history of Israel, we know that if is prominent because sometimes they listen to God, but often they do not. So then, how does all of this really matter? If God is telling them to do something that he knows already, they're going to do it, but then they're going to not do it. Sometimes it's going to be uh, obedient and willing, and sometimes they're going to be totally disobedient. Then what does it mean then? Why give them something that they're going to crash and burn with anyway? Well, it's important to keep in mind, these same things are also the criteria for relationship with God. If you do these things, you will be a peculiar people. You will be a peculiar treasure um, above all people. And it's going to talk more about the holiness. Matter of fact, let me just bring this in real quick. Verse 6, and we'll talk some more. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, Moses is going to go down there and tell them that. And in verse 7 it says that Moses came and, and, and he called the elders and the people of the land before their faces. Uh, all these words which the Lord had said, uh, uh, had commanded them. And let me just get this in real quick and then we'll go back and talk about this. Verse 8. And all the people answered together and said all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Okay. Let's, let's delve into this. Um, they're not going to keep it all. We know that. We know the history. They're going to be sometimes up, sometimes down. But the Lord says that if you keep it, you will have a relationship. But if you don't keep it, then what's going to happen? You don't have it. And so you've got to keep renewing it and keep doing it over again. And, and so what God is going to introduce, because he knows they're not going to do it, he's going to introduce two things. One is temporary and one is permanent. The one that's temporary is already, I know I'm telling you to do this, and that whole if I know you're not going to do it, so I'm going to have a temporary way for you to work on the, when you stop and you don't do the things I just told you to do, I'm going to have a, 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 a allegory to the cleansing of your sins for a temporary covering that can allow you for a, a time to have a conversation or a connection to me. And that is the sacrifices and the offerings that we're going to see. However, even more significant is this also is what the criteria is going to be for the one that can redeem. Because what, what God is saying, if you did this, you could be redeemed. We could always have relationship. But that means you would have to do it, and you can't. Well, since you can't do it, that means you're going to always have broken relationship. And you only get broken relationship because of the mercy of God. Because really, if you did it once, you should be moved away. But God's mercy allows for the sacrificing of animals and so forth to keep you coming back. You, you break it again, and you get to come back. You break it again, and you get to come back. Until God brings the permanent answer. And that permanent answer is the sacrifice that is made by who? Jesus Christ. And so, when you plug this in now... And you say uh, in verse 5, it says, if you will uh, obey my voice. Well, we know Jesus and the Father had no disconnection. Jesus said he, he knows the Father and he obeys the Father. He says, I'm going to do the will of the Father. That's the, the beauty of that body that God had prepared for him before the foundation of the world that he now put himself into and spoke to the Father saying, I'm here to do your, 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 your will. And he will always hear God's voice. And he will always be the peculiar treasure. In other words, unique. No one else like him. 
that's what that whole peculiar means. All right, uh, and, and and the thing that God says, I'm choosing Israel, but He also said, and this is in verse five towards the bottom, for all the earth is mine. In other words, God loves all the nations; He loves all the people, but He's going to have Israel to be a peculiar person, a, a, a peculiar nation. But even in that, which Jesus will come through that lineage, which is important, which is why that the mercy that God showed Israel of allowing them to have the sacrifices kept them going until the permanent sacrifice came, which was Jesus, came through their lineage. So Israel did their part in, in, in continuing to stay attached, though imperfect, though flaw, uh, 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 flawed, and though uh, uh, inconsistent, God brought grace and mercy to keep them attached until Jesus came through. This is beautiful when you think about it. You look at this and you just look at how God is just working this out. Uh, and then it says that, um, that the Jewel, he will be a, a kingdom of priests. All right, we saw in the last chapter how uh, Jethro came as a priest of God and was given Moses some instruction. And that's what the priest does. It comes to give instruction. And that's what who? Jesus does. Israel did it for a while. Sometimes they did it. Other times they didn't. But when Jesus comes, he's going to be our ultimate, what? High priest. And he's going to give us the instructions on what we should do. And he says, and a holy nation. Well, you know, that's that part about that, that you know, that part of what we just don't have. We don't have holiness continual. Our holiness is some timing. Um, our holiness is uh, up and down. Um, and it, it, it's, 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 it's so broken to where it's, it's, it's not holiness. Uh, therefore, we have to have holiness given to us. And that's, again, what Jesus does. It's temporary through all the sacrifices and offers that we're going to see going forward. But it's permanent through Jesus. And that's the beauty of this when you look at this. All right? Uh, it says, and then, and then we said that Moses went and he told all the people. That's what Jesus did. He came and he what? He told everybody. He told the nation. He came and he taught. All right? Um, and that's what uh, we're supposed to uh, uh, do as well. We're never going to do it like Jesus. But we are to be what uh, the scripture tells us to do here. And you say, well, this is an Old Testament scripture. Still, it applies. We ought to still try to be holy. We ought to still try to be a priest. Uh, but yet, we recognize our holiness is not attached to us completely. Our effort and the desire and hunger is all there, but the ability to do is lacking. So therefore, we just rest in what Jesus did. I can now say I'm holy not because of me. I'm holy because of what Jesus did. Therefore, I can go what? Boldly to the throne. I can go and pray. I can go and seek God. Why? Because I kept this? I did all of this? No. I did it. I can do that because what Jesus did. And that's the beauty that we see here uh, when we look at this. Alright? Um... All right, let me move along here. Um, look at verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto you in a thick cloud. All right, so he's coming to him in a form which they had saw coming out of Egypt. All right, something familiar. Uh, that the people may hear uh, when I speak with thee and believe uh, thee forever. And Moses told the words, of uh, the people unto the Lord. So he, the Lord let them know, I'm coming to you in a thick crowd. I'm coming to you in something familiar. Something that you're used to. Okay? Um, what are, what's our familiarity? We're familiar, something that we're used to, that we can, we can look up and always see the, the, uh, the presence of God in our what? In our word, in the word of God. You can just go in there and you can just get a word from God. If you accept it. All right? And that understanding and that word then tells us that he is here, that he's with us. Lord, I'm with you always. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. you know, and teaches us, okay, well, how do I communicate? Well, like this, you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. Eh? So all of that is in the word. It's familiar. We can go to it if we decide to trust it and use it. 
Same thing with the cloud and the pillar of their day. It's something they're familiar with, they've seen it, they trust it. But if they stop trusting in it, then they're going to go back to worry, uh, fear, and, and dread. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes? And I, I feel that the cloud was mainly for the people mm -hmm. to ensure them that Moses is bringing them information from God. Right. Exactly. So it was um, verifying um, or fortifying them to believe that these that Moses is with God. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's that it's, it's that seal, that connective seal that Moses is with you. Uh, I'm sorry to say that God is with Moses, and so you can have confidence in what Moses is saying, is saying because mm -hmm. you know it's not coming from the mind and heart of Moses. It's coming from God. And that's an important uh, uh, aspect to it. All right. Um, Ten. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them uh, today and tomorrow, and then let them wash their clothes. All right. That's sanctification. Okay. Why are we doing this? Because you're going through a ceremonial cleansing. You cannot come to God and not be pure. You have to be uh, uh, right. We're going to talk about this in a, in a little bit, so let me keep going. I, I, I got more to say about, about this, but let me move along and bring in something else with it as well. Verse 11. Uh, and uh, be ready against the third day. All right, there we go with that what? That third day again, right? So th that third day after the washing and the purifying of yourselves, then you're going to be uh, introduced to the presence of God in a unique way. All right. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon the Mount Sinai. So that third day, you will have that, that unique, uh, 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 relatable experience with God on the mountain. All right. We talked about this once again. Uh, when do we when do we get that that uh, that true relatable connection to God? When did when did God being distant become no longer? It was after Jesus was was dead for how many days? On the third day, he what he rose. And the scripture says that the the um, the veil in the temple, which separates the holy of holies from the rest of the the, the temple, was ripped in, in half. It was ripped from the top to the bottom. So now you can what? Come to God. So what they're saying, on the third day, we're going to be able to meet with God. That's what Jesus provides as well. His death and burial, after the third day, we now can what? Meet and communicate with God. Uh, uh, and so many scenarios of, uh, of, 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 of comparisons to this, but let's move along. Verse 12. Because we want to uh, point out this sanctification here. Uh, and thou shalt uh, set bond uh, abound uh, uh, unto the people round about. In other words, barriers. Certain things you just can't do. Can't go, you know, you just can't go everywhere you want to go. And sometimes we don't like that, you know, because we feel like we're being, you know, confined. Well, there's certain times where God will confine you for your own good. You got a fish tank in your house. That fish tank is keeping that water in a confined space. If that fish says, I, don't, I, I want to bust out of this fish tank. Well, no, you want to stay in there if you want to live. You come out of that fish tank, you're going to die. Yeah, that's, where your, that's where your substance and the, and the environment that will sustain you is contained. So being bond is not always a bad thing. But let's keep going here. Uh, <clears throat> uh, take heed unto yourselves that ye go not up uh, unto the mountain or touch it uh, the border of it uh, uh, whosoever touches the mountain shall be, be surely put to death look at that let's keep going we're going to get this sanctification in here in a minute there shall not be a hand touch it but he that surely uh, he shall surely be what stone or shot through. In other words, you're going to hit him with some big rocks or you're going to shoot him with an arrow. You say, why? We're going to get to that in just a bit. It's about that sanctification and that holy. All this is part of that. 
uh, whether it be beast or man, I don't care whether it's an animal or a human being, you're going to stone it or shoot it through with an arrow. And the reason why you're going to stone it and shoot it through with an arrow, so you don't kill it with your hands. I don't want you touching it because it's unholy. So you got to kill it with something that is distant from you, an arrow or a stone. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It shall not live. When the trumpet sound, soundeth long, they shall come up to the mountain. Okay. God is saying, I'm going to put a, some boundaries around. I want you near me, but there's certain places in my experience you can't come yet. Um, though I'm going to call Moses up, I'm going to put a unique covering and protection on Moses, and we're going to see here in a minute, also Aaron, and, um, and they're going to be able to go beyond those borders and those boundaries, but you can't. Why? Because you're not, you don't have the same holiness that God has. And if you come to God, the holiness and the, and, the, and the righteousness of God will consume you. Because anything in the presence of God will instantly match the same holy criteria that God has. And if you are of that, if you don't have that criteria and don't have the mechanisms to sustain that kind of criteria, you will be consumed. Give you an example. You set up a campfire. The campfire is useful. And you say, all right, we got the campfire. Everybody come around. Let's get together. And we're going to, and we're going to get there. And it's kind of chilly night. The campfire is going to give you some what? Some heat, some warmth. But just because it gives you heat and warmth, you don't do what? You don't jump in the fire. Because the fire will do what? It will consume you. All right? So the fire is there to give you the heat, give you the warmth. Plus, you say, okay, we want to roast some hot dogs or cook some marshmallows or something. You put them on the stick. You reach out there. You make sure that you don't put your hand in the fire. Why? Because the fire will, 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 will try to match your body temperature to its temperature. It's going to try to bring you to the same uh, 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 degree that it's at. And you're not able to do that. So therefore... It will destroy your cells, whatever, whatever. You put your hand in there, your feet, you know, God forbid your whole body, whatever you put in there, it's going to start transforming it to match the heat it has. It's the same thing with God. You're, you come to the presence of God, you have to match His holiness. And if you don't, it starts consuming you. Because God will never be less holy than He is. He will always be extremely holy. And so anything around him is going to match his holiness. Which is why we have to have the holiness that is given to us by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus gives us holiness that matches the holiness of God. Therefore, we can come into his presence with that covering. All right? And if we don't have that covering, you're in a world of trouble. Yes? Even the sanctifying that uh, this uh, ceremony that they took on still doesn't make that sacrifice make them able to come in God's presence. Exactly. So our all that we doing ourselves to make ourselves uh, clean and uh, sanctified is still less. No. It's still less. Right. So uh, unless we could, only if we come with the sanctification of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. allows us to be in the presence of God. Exactly. Exactly. So you know. Uh, we can't ever say, I achieved it. I did it. It's not an I thing. It's not, it's not you. You have to trust what Jesus did. That's how you get to be in the very presence of God. Now, God will always, from time to time, give a temporary covering that will, that will match what you do. It's just like we can go out and get these fire departments, they got this suit they can put on where they can walk through fire. And they can be there for a period of time and not be singed, don't get burned up, don't have smoke, don't have any of that stuff. And they're fine. They can't live in it, but they can experience it for a period of time. And God does that for 
different ones. He did it for Isaiah. And the minute Isaiah was called up to heaven, God covered him with a temporary covering. But Isaiah recognized, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm about to be consumed. I feel like a dead man. Because, well, how would you feel if you were thrown into the midst of fire? You would be like, oh my goodness. And the Hebrew boys, the same thing. You know? So those are the things that you got to keep in mind. God does, from time to time, produce temporary coverings that will allow you to experience unique representations of himself. However, we want that permanent one that Jesus offers. That's the one we want. All right? All right, let's move along. All right, now we talked about that trumpet. We're going to hear that again. It says, uh, let me just read that again. It's in the second part of verse 13. It says, when the trumpet sounded long, they shall come unto the mountain. Now, uh, we're going to see here in a minute. I want you to keep a, a, a keen eye out for a trumpet, okay, as we keep going through this reading. Okay, let's move along. 14. And Moses went down uh, from the mountain unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. Okay, once again, signifying. I'm washing the clothes. That represents, I, 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 I am uh, giving a... Uh, an allegiance to cleansing that which I need to cleanse. The outer things that covers me. So the washing of it was symbolic. The covering that Jesus gives us is eternal. And it's real. And it's spiritual. Alright? All right? That's the clothes. That's the garment that we're going to put on. Jesus talked about that so often. About making sure you have on the right, what? Wedding garment. Alright? 15. And... Uh, and he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Talk about the third day, right? Come not uh, unto your wives. Okay. So he's saying, now, be ready, sanctify, wash your clothes, and don't have any relations with your wives. Husbands and wives are not supposed to come together in, in intimate uh, situations. Why? Because you're moving against the flesh. Don't give the flesh anything. So why would you be in a wilderness, in the desert, climbing a mountain, and I'm still going to feed the flesh this. No. we got to separate all the things, the pleasures of the flesh. The flesh cannot have what it needs. So therefore, it's proper and legitimate and altogether right for a husband and a wife to be together. But what the Lord is saying, on this particular situation, for this particular day, you should not have that opportunity to come together because it's only going to feed the flesh. All right? All right. All right, so don't come unto your wives. Um, 16. 16. And uh, it shall come to pass on the third day. There's that third day again. All right? In the morning. All right? In the morning when I what? When I rise. That's what Jesus uh, uh, gives the description of. Uh, that there shall be, now watch this there are going to be thunders have you heard thunders before? of course we have and lightnings, have you seen lightnings before? yes we have and thick clouds have we seen thick clouds before? sure, we've all seen that uh, upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud well, wait a minute. Thunder, he didn't say the thunder is exceeding loud. But we know thunder is loud. But the voice of the trumpet is exceeding loud. Well, what is this all about? It's the second time we, we, we hear this thing about the trumpet. But then if we go back and we say, we, we, we remember what uh, was said in Thessalonians, for the, uh, for the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice and the trump of God. And the Lord, uh, and, and, and they that are uh, asleep. Uh, asleep shall be caught up to be with him. Uh, and then we which are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up to be with the Lord. And then shall we be with the Lord forever. I didn't quote that properly, but you, you get my gist, right? But that whole aspect of the trump of God, that voice trumpet, that we don't see on a regular basis, represents the actual presence of the Lord coming. So... I often think about the fact that, you know, we think about, well, what's going to happen when the rapture happens? I think that this is going to be something that is possible. Now, let me just say this. That's just my thinking. It doesn't say that here. There's no allegories to that other than that verse that I just kind of quoted to you. 
in Thessalonians. Uh, however, uh, it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. The, the, that trump of God, will, is it possible that that would be the thing that they're talking about? When these folks disappeared, when the rapture happened, we, it, it, we, we saw the, the, the thunder, the lightning, and the cloud, but then we also witnessed this trump, because that's what it says. The trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord. A unique package. That package. That unique. That unique connection. Those, those, those connections, that whole package together, produce this here. Uh, once again, that's just my thinking. Uh, I'm not telling you to, I'm just throwing that out there as, so you can know how I think. Uh, but that don't mean that's how you should think, all right? All right, but anyway, let's keep going. So the, uh, the, that trumpet, which is exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. So they weren't scared just because they heard thunder. They heard thunder before. Lightning, clouds, that trumpet, that's what got them, all right? Moses brought forth, this is verse 17, the people uh, out of the camp, un, uh, the camp to meet God, to meet with God, and they stood at the uh, nether part of the mountain. So they stood where they were supposed to stand. All right, and Mount Sinai, uh, and Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke. All right, so it was all together. There was smoke coming out of it because of the Lord descending upon it in a fire. So there was unique things that they could observe that represented the very presence of God. Smoke and fire. All right? and, and, and it's to that point why I, I like to use fire as an illustration of holiness. Because it shows the purification. That God's coming down consuming anything that's not like Him. Which is why we got to be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And if you don't change your heart and your mind, you're not going to have the ability to match the righteousness and holiness that Jesus provides so we can be in the very presence of God. We got to be just, we got to have that same fire to be able to be in the presence of the fire of God. Jesus provides that. That's the covering. That's the righteousness, the holiness that he gives us. All right. It says, uh, because the Lord descended from the from fire, and the smoke thereof ascended, as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. So now there was like an earthquake, a shaking. The planet began to move, so to speak. Um, and that's something that, that you know we could talk about, but we're going to be talking about that a little bit later in a couple of other chapters. So we'll, we'll stop there with that, about the quake. Look at 19. And when the voice of the trumpet, there's that trumpet again, all right, sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by voice. So that once again, that, that trumpet kind of represents the beginnings of the communication of God. God is about to say something profound or revelational. He's going to say something that will, will be transformative. All right, um, and that's what's happening here. Does that speak to anything about our future? I can't say definitely, but I would say I certainly think so. I, that's my opinion, but I, I believe it does speak to things about the Lord coming, uh, especially during the time of the rapture or other things. Uh, uh, but uh, those are things that we can kind of uh, uh, keep in mind. That that's just my thinking. Verse 20. And the Lord came down unto Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down. Now, here's interesting. God just called Moses up. Now he's telling him to what? Go down. See, these are things that we would say, Well, well Lord, listen. Tell me everything you need me to tell me what I need to bring up when I come up to the mountain so I don't have to go up and then come back down and then go back up again. That's how we think. We're looking for efficiency. Why make me climb this mountain more than I need to? That's not how God works. See, God ain't trying to be efficient. God is just being perfect. So there are times when you're going to have to go up the mountain, go back down, then come back up again. 
And sometimes you be looking at it. Now, I, haven't I gone through this already? And you think maybe, well, it's something that I just am doing wrong. Or, and it, and it could be, but it also could be the Lord is just saying, I need you to go up and down this on a regular basis for whatever reason. All right? And so sometimes you don't get discouraged so quickly because you're experiencing ups and downs that you kind of experienced before. I've, I've climbed this before, and now I'm climbing back down, now I'm climbing it again. That's very well could be some of the things that God would just have you to do. All right, so 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down and charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze. And I, I, I highlighted the word gaze, because gaze means not to come to touch, but to look, to kind of to gain a, a perspective of. All right? Uh, and many of them perish. So, even though some people may say, well, I'm not going to try to touch, but I'm going to try to get to a certain angle, and I'm going to try to find a loophole in this where I can see what's going on. Don't have that attitude. If God says stay here because he don't want you to see or experience something, stay there. Don't try to outsmart or out-trick God because you can't, number one. It's impossible. And number two, you're only going to do yourself hurt. All right. Verse 22. And let the people also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break, break forth upon them. All right, so once again, you come into the presence of the Lord, make sure you're sanctified. Did you wash your clothes last night, like he said? Did you clean your outer garments? Did you stay away from your wife and your husband? Did you do that? If you didn't do that, don't come near here. Those were the requirements. Okay? So do the basic things that you need to do. All right? um, we need to take on the righteousness of Christ. You can't just take it on. You just can't put it on. You have to what? Believe Jesus. You've got to accept God. Everybody might want to say, well, just give me God's right. Give me the righteousness. No, no, no. I can't just give it to you. And number one, I can't give it to you. It has to be given to you by who? Jesus. But in order to give it, to get it from Jesus, you first have to have the what? The relationship, the connection. The agreement, the faith, the trust, the obedience to God, to the Lord Jesus, to the Spirit of God. And then He will give you the righteousness. He will give you the proper clothing. So if you don't have it, don't try coming near unto God because you ain't ready. Right? Even though you got instructions. But did you do it? All right. So did you, are you following the teachings of Jesus? All right. Um, 23. And, the, and Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come unto the mountain, Mount Sinai, for thou hast charged us, saying, set uh, bounds about the mount and sanctify. So when Moses is saying, well, Lord, you've already told us this. You, you said this already. And But what God is saying, remember, he used a different word. He said gaze. So make sure you go out and tell them, don't try anything tricky. Don't try anything slick. Don't try to look for loopholes. Do what I told you to do. And so what God is telling Moses, and Moses is like, well, you already told us that. I know. But go down because there's people gazing and looking for, for ways that they can maneuver. Don't do that. Do what you were told the way you were told. Some people say, well, I'm going to find a way to get my own righteousness. No, you're not. And some people try, I'm going to go, you know what I'm going to do? I want to go up on a mountain myself I'm going to live away from everybody so I don't have to have no temptations next to me. I'm not going I'm going to live a monk's life. I'm just going to be I'm not going to have any TV, I'm not going to have any radio. I'm going to do all of that and I'm going to find a way to produce my own righteousness. No you're not. It's not going to happen. You got to go the way the Lord said. Don't try to get tricky and slick and, and try to be all clever. Do what God told you to do. And that's what God is telling Moses. And Moses is like, well, I already said it that. No, Moses, go down and tell him again. Because there's some people got something in their heart they're trying to do to get in. And it's not going to work. Alright. 24. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come back up. So go down, tell the people what I told you, and then I want you to come back up. Thou and Aaron. So I told you, Aaron's going to be asked to also come up. And go closer than how everybody else was. So God's going to prepare both Moses and Aaron to go a little further past the 
obvious boundaries and God's going to give them what they need to make that journey. Okay? Uh, and Aaron with thee. Uh, but let not the priests and the people break through. So I'm telling you, for you and Aaron to come past the boundary, but don't let anybody else, not even these priests or any, anybody else that think they're so right, go any further because it's not going to work for them. Don't let the, the priests and the people break through to come unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. All right, if you come through, you're going to get upon you what he said, and that was what? Death. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. All right, as you can see, this is beautiful allegory towards Jesus Christ. It says a lot of things, um, and uh, I, what I want to do.